Hello, everyone, and welcome to the European Insurer Value Analysis 2021. So this uh, presentation will look at the best in class of the European insurers. And to kick off, Bill is going to take us through this presentation, which should be about 40 minutes or so, leaving about 20 minutes for questions. So please, everyone, um, do think of some good questions to post and we will answer them at the end. So. Without much further ado, let's pass over to you, Bill. Thank you, Saxon. Before I begin, let me uh, thank CGI uh, for sponsoring um, the, the study and for the support and partnership that it gives to Accord and the industry. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Sabine and Alchemy Crew and her team who helped uh, with a lot of this analysis. Um, let me uh, uh, begin, and I'm gonna move somewhat quickly and share the presentation time with Sabine. Um, we looked at 40 major European headquartered insurers. And by that, we mean carriers who had, may have had global operations or may just be confined to Europe. Um, five were pure PNC, six were pure life insurance writers, and 29 wrote both non-life and life. Those 40 carriers represented 1.2 trillion in uh, euros of annual revenue 780 billion in premiums alone, and they were approximately 14% of the entire world's premium base. And we looked at five years of quantitative and qualitative data in order to draw strategic tactical uh, insight. Bill, uh, we are not seeing your screen yet. Okay. Okay, I apologize. Well, that's technology. Perfect. Now you see it? Correct, yes. yes. Okay, very good. It was sharing before. Okay, so as I said, 40 major insurers, 1.2 trillion euros in annual revenue, five years of qualitative and quantitative data. And we looked at financial, strategic, and tactical implications, right? We uh, then developed a proprietary value methodology, which I'll speak about. And as I said, observations, implications, and imperatives across both strategic and tactical implications. These 40 carriers were scattered across um, Europe. Uh, here we see the number of carriers listed um, 40 of them, again, five pure PNC or non-life, six life, 29 multi-line. Why these 40? Well, they had material scale and scope, right? So they were large. Um, data completeness and quality was critical, right? In order to do the type of analysis that we did, we needed to uh, have um, five years of complete data. And we plan on doing this study every year. So it'll grow uh, over time to six and seven and ultimately 20 years. And we do a corollary of this study in the US over a 20 year time period and uh, detailed analysis and insight across those carriers. So I wanted to at least put this out there and say, when you look at an insurer, there's a number of stakeholders, right? Clearly there's employees and policyholders and those that own it, um, channel partners, communities, regulators, creditors, and vendors. And there's a number of factors or variables that you can look at, like combined ratio or embedded value for life carriers, customer sat, um, ratings and compliance, growth and share, brand awareness, workplace attractiveness, social responsibility. For this study, we solely looked at cash flow return, but clearly carriers are more than just cash flow generators. And it's our belief that if you generate cash flow, you have to do the right thing for your communities, your employees, your policyholders, and the rest. But this was the one metric we looked at. Now, what we did was we looked at cash flow divided by invested capital to get a cash flow return, right? And we'll talk about this over the next few pages um, if it's not fully clear just yet. But again, how much cash flow did you generate? Not accounting income, but genuine cash flow versus the invested capital required to generate that cash flow to give that return. We then compared the carrier, each of those individual 40 carriers to the market. Um, we took those uh, results and outcomes and looked at over 40 quantitative metrics and qualitative metrics across the 40 carriers. And we looked at it over a one year, three year and five year time frame in order to understand who did so in a sustainable uh, way and were there differences in those that did it and those that didn't do it. Well, the top quartile, so the top 25% or 10, 25% of 40 is 10, we identified the top 10 carriers, the top 25% out of the 40, uh, with the highest cash flow return, uh, as opposed to the bottom 25%, the bottom 10, and then the middle 50. 
So we're going to talk about these three groups in terms of cash flow return. Um, those that achieve the highest uh, cash flow return, top 10%, bottom 10%, um, uh, and that are bottom 25%, top 25%, and middle four, uh, 50%. So 10, uh, 20, and 10 in terms of carriers. So when you look to the average, and by the way, if you've seen one carrier, you've seen one, the average revenue generated um, by these firms was 6.2 billion euros over that five-year time period. That's annual revenue. The cash flow generated averaged 2 billion of an invested capital base of 27.4 billion for an average cash flow return of 7.5%. So that was the average for all 40 carriers. That 7.5% is a key number because that's the number we're going to use to categorize. In terms of the poor performers, you can say they only had a 4% cash flow return. And you can look at the cash flow revenue and invested capital numbers, but the real key number is that 4%. Then we got to the middle tranche. They had 9.1%, materially better than the 7.5, but um, and clearly better than the 4%, but not as good as the top 10%, top 10 or top 25% of 16.9, that's almost 17% um, cash flow return on their invested capital. So we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about these three groups and what they did differently and what characterized high performers versus lower performers. Now, when you compare those averages, right, versus the study, 2.3X versus that 7 point, so 16.9 divided by 7.5, 2.3X, the middle 50%, 1.2x with the poor performers, the lowest decile, achieving half of the average, approximately half on a rounded basis. So let's look at these groups. Again, 4.0% for the bottom quartile, 9.1% for the middle 50%, and 6.9% for the top 25%, and the average is 7.5%. When you look at revenue, well, what you notice already is that the top 25% of carriers generated only 10% of the revenue. They're smaller, right? The middle 50% of carriers generated 60% of all of the uh, revenue and, 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 uh, and the bottom generated 30. So you're 25%, you generated 30. So clearly you're um, uh, bigger on average. Now let's look at that cash flow. So pay attention to the top 25% of the carriers. 10% of the revenue, 13% of the cash flow. That might not seem like much, but that's 30% greater than the expected value. And then you see the bottom, 30% of the revenue, uh, but only 21% of the cash flow. So you begin to see why there's that 4% cash flow return versus the 169. Now, when you look at cash flow divided by revenue, so think about is that a cash flow margin, right? How much profit over revenue, but this is cash flow margin. Well, here you see a 38, a 37, and a 24. So indexed to the average, there was a 33% cash flow margin. The high performers were 117% better, with the poor performers being 71%, and that middle tranche, that middle 50%, being 1.1x, or 111%. And lastly, that invested capital. Look at those green numbers here, right? 10% of the revenue, 13% of the um, uh, cash flow, and only 5% of the invested capital, right? That's just a tremendous, right? Tremendous um, uh, outcome here. And when you look at cash flow, that really equals these two metrics, right? Cash flow divided by revenue times revenue divided by invested capital. For those that remember the DuPont formula, this is a quasi DuPont formula, revenue and revenue cancel. So you begin to see the synergistic effect of generating a higher percentage of cash flow as a percent of revenue and really being efficient. So when you look at that last metric, that revenue as a percent of invested capital, it's almost a invested capital efficiency ratio, almost the equivalent of a total asset turnover ratio, right? So how much revenue did you generate as a percent of the capital? Uh, clearly, there are differences based on whether you're a life insurer or a, a general insurer or a mixed group, but nonetheless, you begin to see what drove some of the underlying economics. Now, when you look at the five-year total shareholder returns, and that's real share price appreciation plus dividends, there's the average for the 600 largest 
uh, European stocks. It was a 32.3% uh, return on a five-year basis, TSR. When you look to R35, now remember we had 40 carriers, but only 35 are publicly traded. The rest are actually um, uh, mutuals, right? You see that there was a 46.7% return. So insurance over the last five years did appreciably better than the average uh, European uh, stock. And when you look to the poor performers, right, you'll notice that the poor performers and the middle 50% actually had very close returns. What you will see though is those poor performers, there were nine of them, 26%, nine divided by right the, the 35. So 26%, they represented 22% of the market cap. They are very, very big carriers, right? So 9%, 26% of the carriers representing 22% of the market cap, they're big. You look at the green, they're 23% of the publicly traded carriers or eight carriers, and they represent only 8% of the market cap, relatively small. Now, one of the things that struck us as being incredibly odd is when we do this study in other parts of the world, the poor performers really underperform the average for the, st for the study and the high performers really outperform. I wanted to give you the results of the US study, right? And show you really what the US did. So when you look to the US study, the US study on an index basis, the high performers performed 137% better. That middling group performed 46% as well as the average and the poor performers performed 14%. In this study, what you see is the bottom 25% and the middle 50% roughly on a statistical basis have the same kind of TSR. There's a big gap in the US study. 40 versus 14. And when you look to the uh, top performance, that was 137% better. And 53, 54% is not 137% better than the 46. Now we have a number of hypotheses here. It may be that they're thinly traded. It may be that the US study is a 20 year time frame. Markets can be a lot more efficient and accurate when given 20 years. It could be that many of these carriers are traded on local country exchanges and certainly there's requirements regarding local companies and how they invest their money and it may dampen their returns. But as we move forward with the study over the next several years, we will dig into this because it, it doesn't necessarily support the hypothesis that cash flow leads to higher TSRs. It just could be the time frame, but it could be the peculiarities of where these stocks are traded or the sample size. We will grow that over time, but I wanted you to at least get a glimpse as to what the study says in other geographies and the US is a good example of that. Now, when you look at revenue quartiles, so we broke the carriers into uh, uh, billions of euros and here they are stacked. You see the biggest carrier is well over 120 billion euro with the smallest one hovering at just a few billion euro. What you find is that amongst revenue quartiles, so carriers one through 10 ranked for size, there aren't any of those Q4 high performers in. Of the next tranche of carriers, you see three out of the 10 or 30% of them are high performers. But going all the way to the smallest carriers, 31 through 40 ranked on size to the right of the page, that right tail, half of them are high performers. Clearly, um, this leads to the insight that smaller performers have an easier time to sustain high performance over time. And perhaps there are some diseconomies of scale and scope. Uh, when you're larger. And Sabine later on is going to talk about some of the characteristics and traits we found from those carriers. Now, when you look at cash flow returns versus cash flow CAGR, 3.2% was the average cash flow return. That's that horizontal gray line. And when you look at that vertical gray line, um, I'm sorry, the 7.5% is the cash flow return. And when you look at the horizontal line, that 3.2 is the average cash flow CAGR right? That's the y-axis and the x-axis. Now, when you look to the high performers, as you remember, they had a cash flow return of 69, right, overall versus that 7.5. So they're to the right. Their cash flow CAGR was 6.9 versus 3.2. So over 2x faster. So they grew, grew cash flow faster and they had a higher cash flow return. The yellow, that middle 50%, the size of the ball here represents size of the premium generated. If you remember, they had a cash flow return of 9.1% versus an industry average of 7.5. And they grew cash flow at 3% versus 
versus an average of 3.2. So they had lower than average cash flow growth, but they did decently with cash flow return. And the lower performers, that lower quartile, the, the bottom 10 out of the 40, they had a cash flow return um, uh, of 4%. And they had a versus 7.5, and they had a growth rate of only 1.5. But interestingly, they still grew cash flow a bit over this five year time period. Uh, when we look at the individual carriers making up those high performers, what you'll notice is there's a relatively wide range in terms of that width, that left to right, when you look at that cash flow return. The average was higher, but you see a high standard deviation. But they kind of do hug, right? Uh, and cluster around that Y number, right? That 3.2. There's an outlier to the top right, but they basically cluster around there. When you look to that middle 50%, the 20 carriers, now you see a narrowing around that cash flow growth, that, 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 that 3.2. You see a narrowing, but it widens now. Now you do see a higher standard deviation in terms of that cash flow growth, right? Look how much wider it is. And lastly, when you look at the red, you see the same widening of that cash flow growth, but a narrowing overall in terms of their average cash flow return. Hopefully you can, you can see it. I think this is being videoed. You can look at it again, but you do see a narrowing as you move from green to yellow to red, that they become more clustered vertically, right? But less distributed or more distributed as well when you move from left to right in terms of the returns. Now, what, we don't have time for all of these charts. Um, but this study would take hours and hours, and we only have 40 minutes to present. Um, clearly, the high performers had superior cash flow. However, they did lose market share overall over the time period studied. And that's a big insight. Let me say it again. Whilst they generated superior cash flow returns, significantly higher, they actually lost share overall. Uh, next, they had a superior return on assets and return on ROE. So we mentioned DuPont formula earlier. That's no surprise, right? They had superior cash flow. So it's, that's not a big surprise here. And lastly, this was very surprising for us. 20% of the high performers were mutuals <clears throat> versus 12% for the study. That's incredibly insightful. Now I will tell you in other geographies, mutuals tend to underperform their publicly traded counterparts. In theory, a mutual carrier should be able to perform better because they should solely be worried about creating value for their owners, which happens to be their policyholders. So it was very interesting to see that European mutual carriers outperformed uh, the market in general. So it's kind of heartening to see how mutuals uh, doing a good job for their policyholders. We then said, look, on a five-year basis, as we said, we identified the top 10 right carriers at 25% the middle 50% or 20 carriers and, and bottom 10% uh, of performers. How stable was that over a five, three and one year time period? Well, over a three year time period, two of the high performers moved down over the trailing 36 months, but still they're sticky, right? Out of the 10, eight of them remain. And we did see one um, poor performer jump up to that middle. So it's it, you can't escape gravity, I guess, to some extent. And for that last tranche, um, you see seven. So that's that number to the right. Seven carriers remained as high performers throughout. So that's about 70%. So 14 of the uh, middle performers remained and eight out of 10. So 80% of the poor performers, even when you looked at it on a one, three, five, they remained in that poor performer. So I promise you, we're quickly moving away from the maths part of all of this. And I'm going to turn it over to Sabine for a bit to introduce the qualitative uh, factors. So Sabine, please uh, feel free to comment on this before we go into the qualitative section. Yes, thank you very much, Bill. So yes, we balanced uh, qualitative and quantitative analysis. So I'm going to go through the qualitative factors we reviewed. So we started by looking at strategy and tactics, looking at uh, the uh, 40 insurers performance in terms of strategy, where they were located geographically, the lines of business they focused on, the channel they serve their customer and how they manage their brand. Second area we looked at is innovation and change. My favorite topic, a lot of people know that, around digitization. So how digital are those business? How much are they involved with the insure tech world? How do they use platform, what we call now platformification, 
an ecosystem to build their business and what are they doing from an MA point of view. And lastly, we looked at leadership and culture. That included looking at governance structure, board diversity, CEO backgrounds, so where are those CEOs coming from, and the culture of the business and how decisions are being made. So let's start with strategy and tactics. I will jump in just for strategy. Look, there's only four strategies in insurance, operational excellence, a nice way of saying compete on price or being efficient. Next, customer intimacy, right? Treating a customer unique and special, competing based on the quality of the experience or interaction. Product leadership, selling something that no one else sells, really offer quality in the solution. And then lastly here, innovation, discontinuous change, really doing something 10x advantage, competing based on speed. Two other ones which are interesting in their own right, unclear, right? There are instances where we as a team could not discern uh, an explicit strategic intent. And lastly, composite strategies, right? Those that actually involve two or more of these factors. When you look to the 40 carriers, 20% of them had unclear strategies. 3% were price competitors. I loathe price competition and uh, less than 3% uh, of the 40 availed themselves of that option. 10% competed based on product, 30% customer, 7% innovation and 30% on a composite. So one third approximately doing two or more of these things and clearly unclear wouldn't be one of them. Well, when you look to the high performers, only 10% had unclear strategies. That's surprising me that it's that high, but it was 10% of them, one out of the 10, actually had a very unclear strategy versus 20. There were no explicit price competitors. It doesn't mean they didn't use price as a lever, but if you look at that composite strategy of 30, then you'll see they could be in there, hence the arrow pointing to the right. 30% of them competed based on product uniqueness or differentiation. 30% competed based on customer uh, segment and differentiation experience. No one explicitly competed based on innovation. But again, that doesn't mean it's not there. I think it's buried and we think it's buried as a team in that composite strategy. Again, I wanted to show you what the US looked like to see uh, how it differs, right? In the US, what we find is that less than 18% competed based on product and 20% competes based on product. And it, they're, in, in, they're in composite, right? From 30% to 52. Interestingly enough, we've been doing this uh, study in the US for over 20 years. The US did look like Europe with 30% product and 30% customer. But over the last several years, it's been trans transitioning to composite. Now, that doesn't mean Europe will follow. It may mean that it stays at 30-30. Composite is a hard strategy to execute, hard in terms of cost, but also hard in terms of difficulty and perilous to execute. But I just wanted you to at least see what a comparable looked like overall. And with that, I'll turn it back to Sabine to talk about execution and focus. So yes, so what we saw um, from the study is that winning or top performers are actually focused on execution. We've seen that they are actually likely to be located in one country rather than looking <coughs> at multiple countries. So that focus on one single market is, we believe, a means for them to drive that success. We also so that they are more likely to be in the property and casualty market 1.4 time vis-a-vis uh, -vis the life and pension providers and to return net premium earns of 1.3 time. We also believe and so that they are more likely to use independent agent two times more than the other uh, providers, the other carriers. And looking at what we've learned uh, in, in, in the UK, I know that the UK is a very um, direct to consumer market, but when we look at the rest of Europe, there's still a very large dependency on the independent agent channels because their customer 
want relationship, regardless as to whether this is, uh, they, they're actually leveraging digital channel, that relationship is very important to buy and service insurance. And the last point we want to make is that from a brand strategy, they tend to be quite independent, meaning that the brand is the brand which is in the country. So big brands usually tend to perform less well than the more narrow and market-focused brands too. So when we look at the second group of characteristics we analyze innovation and change, we actually looked at a lot of different metrics around digitization and using partners to succeed. And I think this is the last time I'm gonna jump in. So Accord does an annual study on digital maturity. And this is just a snapshot of the methodology. It spans all the way from digital laggards or very localized digitization to those with aspirations to the ultimate grouping of digital competitors. Laggards are frozen uh, in the past. Digital aspirations, strategy and resources. There is a budget, there is an effort, there is an initiative, but digital competitors, the ultimate level of maturity, they're really using digital capabilities to drive and optimize outcomes and both for strategic and tactical advantage. We look at a number of factors. It's another study which I've shared with many of you where we look at everything from consumerization to use of data analytics across the value chain, how integrated the internal and external value chains are, it, are digital technologies used to optimize operations, capability alignment, process, organization, IT, value management, increased strategic and tactical degrees of freedom and culture. Uh, what we do find here in terms of digital maturity, and I will turn it back to Sabine though, but I'll start out by saying on average for the 40, 15% of the 40 carriers had localized uh, digitization. Half of them had aspirations. So they're on a journey, they're spending money and 35% uh, were digital competitors. But Sabine, I will turn the rest of the commentary over to you because I know you're very passionate and knowledgeable about this subject. So yes, when we look at our top performers, I think what is interesting is that 30% actually are digitized, digitized competitor and 60% are aspiring to become digital. Uh, and only 10% are actually localized laggard. And uh, that means that a lot of those organizations are going on to a journey of digitization, taking the time to do it, but going on to that journey. We the did that, compare it to the US though, again, Sabine, please yeah. comment on this one. This was, I couldn't help but putting this in. Which I thought was amazing when we looked at it last is that actually in the US, 80% of the top providers, the winning performers are actually digitized competitors and only 20% are digitized as a digital aspiration provider, but they do not have any localized legals, which I thought was interesting, Bill. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the issue tech activity on the baseline, it's pretty much 30, 30, 30. So 35 minimal interaction with um, issue techs, 30% of the uh, overall uh, sample group are working with InsureTechs and 35% are doing a lot of work with InsureTechs. So when we look at the top performers, actually they also have a balance, uh, they are balancing their work with the InsureTech ecosystem. So 30% are doing a lot of work, 30 are doing moderate work and 40% are doing minimal work. But I think what is more interesting is looking at the second trench where 45% are using InsureTech to transform their operation and drive digitization. Whilst the lower performer, 50% of them are doing nothing, which sometimes I think might be a little bit of a worry. Now, from a platform and ecosystem viewpoint, we have found that 20% of the sample group are working with ecosystem or designing a platform. So combining capabilities to become far more digitized, 35% are doing it in a moderate way and 45% are not doing very much in that space. Top performers are building platforms and ecosystem, 10% of them are doing so, and 50% are the next tranche uh, doing it in a moderate way. Again, analyzing, evaluating to make the right choices, and 40% are not doing very much. 
the next tranche, quarter two and three, are doing far more in that space in the sense that they are trying to catch up, I guess, uh, against the, um, the top performers where 30% of them are uh, working on their platform and ecosystem, 40% are uh, doing it in more direct way. But I think as you can see, the more interesting number is for the lower performers, 80% of them are doing nothing. Then when we look at um, the m &A activity, which I think Bill and I found that actually fascinating uh, yes. to, to dive into the m &A activity in Europe, is that top performers are acquiring a lot of business, two times more than the average. They are focusing on acquiring businesses to expand geographically, but also to improve their tech capability. So whilst businesses are working with digitization initiatives and insure techs, and building platform and ecosystem, they are acquiring businesses as well to do so. But they are also more likely to find opportunities to divest their businesses 2.5 times more than the average when the opportunity comes. Very, very active. Yes, Sabine, you're, you and your team discover this incredibly insightful, right? They're actively managing their book, both acquiring and selling. So the last qual uh, qualitative factor and we wanted to discuss is leadership and culture. For diversity, governance, CEO background, and culture and decision making. So what we found fascinating with uh, analysis is looking at board diversity. Out of the 40 organizations we analyzed, um, board diversity is important. 25% um, of the sample group Fun, uh, had actually done a lot of work around board diversity. 50% done more direct work around their board diversity and 25% did minimal work on their board diversity. So let's look at where the sample groups stand. Well, yes, top performer spent time to build diversity on their board, 50%. Whilst the least performing group, 40% are doing nothing. And what we found as part of our study is diversity of the board and acquiring talent, which is diverse, is key for those top players to drive that diversity of thought. When we looked at the CEO profile, what we found, probably not surprisingly, is that CEOs are internally promoted for the top performers. They tend to have a more business and technical background vis-a-vis -vis the less, um, the lower performing uh, quartal and or bringing um, CEOs from the outside, uh, outside uh, insurance. They also tend to be within their company for five to 10 years, which I think is an important fact because when we look at some of the change and transformation work which need to happen in many of those organizations, they don't happen in three years, they need to occur over a period of time. Now looking at the problem from an employee perspective, so we are looking now at the company and what the, the employee think about the, the business. Superior CEO have actually let their organization do things. And what we have noticed is employees have a voice the expert diversity and inclusion that is part of the DNA of the organization and they're happy to say when they feel there's more to be done. They also tend to be receiving higher compensation, getting more career opportunities and also embracing more training programs which are more aligned with the world we are entering now. And from a governance viewpoint, what is fascinating is that 78% of the business we analyze have a centralized governance structure. 50% are decentralized and only seven are federated. Top performer, 90% of the top performers have a centralized governance structure and only 10% have a decentralized governance structure. But we see it's pretty much the same across peer group with 
a much more skewed focus on centralization at the top tier. And that might be because, as we highlighted before, the top performers are smaller businesses and they are country led. I'm going to speak a bit about cultures. Uh, as Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. What we did was we looked at each of these carriers across two dimensions. One, how were they organized? Were they organized explicitly in terms of hierarchy or was it more egalitarian? And how did these carriers make decisions? Was it leader-centric decisions or team-based decisions? So if you think about those two dimensions, organization or structure, um, the hard and the decision-making, the soft. So how did they structure themselves? Well, interestingly enough, when you looked at the high performers, organizations that were hierarchical in terms of how they were organized, structured, and how decisions were made leadership, they were underweight. In other words, command and control. It's hierarchy, uh, hierarchical and there's a leader. They were underweight and high performers. At the other extreme, an organization that was more egalitarian and more team-based, they too were underweight. So this idea of command and control not being effective, true, but also no one really leading and no structure, that doesn't work either. What we did find interestingly is organizations that were organized in a very hierarchical fashion, but where decisions were part of a team-based process, they were very effective in terms of high performance. And those that were structured in terms of an egalitarian uh, basis, but we had a leader, a true leader to say, enough, we've been discussing it, now we're going to move this way. So we just found this incredibly interesting and we'll continue to dig into this over time. And I'm sorry, we don't have time to go into all of this because it was incredibly interesting. Let me turn it back to, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll wrap it up now. Yes. Uh, we did have a number of slides and, and Sabine, please feel free to comment here. Look, to summarize it, in terms of strategy and tactics, have meaningful differentiation in terms of how your strategic intent and how your execution is going to be driven in the marketplace. It has to be valued by your target customers, by those independent agents. Innovation and change. We saw it in terms of M&A, but there's a key message here that means you can't, it's not once and done. This requires ongoing, never ending portfolio optimization. And lastly, as we heard from Sabine across many of these charts, leadership and culture. You have to have core capacity and competency. Capacity means a critical mass of high scale, high will people with the knowledge to drive change through to X to underwrite, to manage claims, to manage relationships with customers and agents. So I think a lot of this is common sense, but you saw these messages driven across. So I know we only had 40 minutes and I believe we've ended just on time, but again, I'd like to thank CGI for the sponsorship, uh, Saxon uh, uh, and, and Insurance Times for hosting this, but most importantly, Sabine and her team at Alchemy Crew for helping to contribute uh, importantly to this study for Accord. And I think we're going to open it up to a bit of questions if there are any. And ultimately when uh, Europe opens up, I'm looking very much forward to presenting this live uh, to our individual members. And we've got 36,000 globally and visiting and, and having events uh, where we can have more of a group dynamic, but I'm happy uh, to be presenting it on the webinar today. Great stuff. Thank you, Sabine. Thank you, Bill, for the interesting presentation. Um, in terms of questions, I mean, one of the questions that comes about is just Sabine, can you give a bit more color as to, you know, what makes a, what makes a digital leader? What sort of features and characteristics do they show? So, I mean, Saxon, you know me, I'm a, a bit of an insurtech uh, person, but um, what we actually saw through the, the analysis is that you can't just do one strategy. You need to use a multitude of initiatives. So part of it will be a digitization, just simplifying your core processes, aligning those to your customer needs. So there is a lot of work which needs to be done around segmentation and really understanding the customer at the end and building for the customer. But for speed, often what I see is insurers realize that they can't do it all and using ecosystem, leveraging tech providers, they could be insure tech, but they could be 
others like cybersecurity or AI companies as well, which are growing fast in, in the market right now, and platforms. So connecting everything with platforms becomes an area for differentiation. So managing speed time to market with the decisions which are made around digitization become key for success. And also on the diversity, um, why do you think it has such a positive effect on the leading insurers which display diversity? What's the reasoning behind it, do you think? What's your view? So you can't build a business with no one. So businesses are based on people. And um, I do feel that, and just from my own personal experience, talking to a lot of insurers, the, uh, the winning performers just put a lot of emphasis on, on driving that diversity. And you know, when we talk about diversity, we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And being able to respond to the customer by uh, emulating what the customer may want by having the right people in teams result in better, um, better outcome. Further, I also think that when you have a team internally who sees that a company care for their people, they are more likely to talk about it and chat about it. And uh, Bill, from your, um, you know, from your going through the study, which of the factors do you think strategically was most important at the four you mentioned in terms of operational excellence and uh, customer intimacy and product leadership innovation? Which one of those four do you think is probably the most? Um, well, if I had, thank you, Sex. If I had, I mean, clearly, I believe that successful execution of a composite strategy is a winning one where you've got. And, if, and I mean comprehensive composite. You've got an effective price, so you're operationally efficient. Efficient. You're delivering a superior customer experience. You've got a real differentiated product, and you're innovative. However, if I had to pick one, Saxon, it would have to be product. Because the reality is, if I'm selling something that no one else sells, and it has inimitable traits, and it's underwritten in a certain way, and there's a claims process, so there's a life insurance attributes. If it's truly differentiated and unique, that tends to be a, a higher value added product. And we did see that in other countries around the world. I mean, think about it. If you're selling a product that's truly different, unique, customers tend to have, insureds tend to have a higher willingness to pay. So if I had to pick one, it would be product. However, we are seeing in other countries, particularly mature geographies around the world, that that's not enough moving forward. Customers increasingly, yeah, they want that special product, but they want it at a good price and they want an innovative and tailored customer experience. So I think in customer demands are being increased at an increasing rate, being shaped by many industries outside of insurance, right? It's not, we're not setting the bar in terms of consumer expectations, retail, banking, manufacturing, travel, they're increasingly setting expectations around experience, product attributes, pricing of requirements and innovative um, uh, solutions. But if I had to pick one, long story short, product. And on that sort of topic, Bill, we're hearing a lot about in the commercial insurance space, how risk management is somewhere where insurers and brokers can really give value add. Um, is that a phenomena that you see going forward in the next few years? Absolutely, which is why, you know, we just let the, the chips fall where they may, so to speak. Independent agents, which are brokers and agents, independent, not internal risk managers, not direct buying, they're overweight by 200%, 2x for the value create. If you are a carrier seeking to establish a meaningful relationship with a good customer, and a good customer is one who pays the appropriate price, stays with you, buy more product, has reasonable and expected loss costs, that relationship, that choice that they make to use a broker or use an agent, that's a higher life and value customer. The customers in the UK, uh, you're very familiar with this, those customers who tend to buy direct and tend to buy from those platform providers, they, they're incredibly disloyal, they shop and switch, they would move to save a pound, it becomes very, very difficult to create value. And we aren't selling commodity in the insurance industry. We put people's lives back together. We put businesses in business and get them started again. This price competition is pernicious. And I think it needs to be avoid, avoided assiduously. And I think individuals or businesses that choose agents are sending a signal to carriers that they understand the importance that insurance has within their lives or within their businesses and they want advice and they tend to be higher life than value customers. So absolutely 
brokers and agents, IFAs, large brokers, whether you're large commercial insurers or individuals, they're not going to go anywhere. Those are value creating customers. And we've got a quick question from uh, one of the attendees who, who joined the webinar, which is how can insurance embrace the uh, changing, insur how can insurers embrace the changing insurance ecosystems? So it's managing that change. What do you think, Sabine? So, well, it's a, it's a journey. I would, say, I would say it's not a destination, it's a journey. But I think one needs to start with what I call, you know, the magic word strategy. But in a sense, like strategy for execution, um, really understanding what are the strengths of a business and actually leverage those strengths to the next level. How you build ecosystem is by also learning how, um, you know, partnership in the world works and observing what is happening in other industry. I spend a lot of time talking about other sectors because I want insurance to realize it's already done so we can learn from other sectors to actually get our own um, duck in a row. But ecosystem are built over time. They need to be based on, on clear thinking and a roadmap, I would say a roadmap. And then by looking at the, the, the strengths and the gaps therefore aligned to those strengths, then you can decide to build it. But I would say it's faster now to look at ecosystem building and partnership opportunities. Bill, do you have a view on that? I'll make it simple. I think the essence of strategic intent is resource allocation. To Sabine's point, if it's a journey, do you have a plan? Do you have a vision? Do you have a budget? Do you have an understanding of the gap between where you are and where you want to go? Understanding you'll never get there. I think too many organizations don't invest the resources. And that isn't just money, but it's also leadership, right? In terms of promoting the journey, sustaining on an ongoing basis and investing the talent uh, in, in navigating it. Too many times with an insurance, there's always pressing needs, whether it's a catastrophe or whether it's re-underwriting a book or whether it's renewal season, but this requires a sustained and explicit investment over time. Invest leadership uh, management and also give it the adequate budget to get it done, right? It requires a long-term perspective. The payback isn't going to be next quarter or this year, right? You have to have real stewardship within your organization. Just to jump in there, Saxon and Bill, I mean, one of the things, I, Bill, you just took the words out of my mouth. It's exactly what I was thinking. One of the things that came through for me for the top performer characteristics was those that invested in talent development and nurturing. And, you, and Sabine, you mentioned about the CEOs that tend to rise through and they tend to be the higher the higher performers because they know their stuff, they look after their people. And I think that's that's isn't surprising. What is surprising is how few companies actually do it well. Um uh, that's that's the only surprise to me but um uh, I th and i was going to ask the bean actually i mean if you're seeing more of that i think we know that's the right way to to be successful to invest in your people to look after your people but are you seeing that trend improving um, over time so i would i'm going to be cautious around the so i i do not you know we looked at 40 tires and uh, within those 40 carriers, you know, we, we talked to a lot of them. I would say that the, the one who comes from insurance and I've observed and learned, and some also are shifting businesses are actually trying to build really caring businesses, creating insurance businesses. Do I see more? I think there is, a, I would say some businesses realize there's no choice. Um, you know, some of the trends which are affecting us because of moving out of the current crisis mean that a lot of insurance business need to change. They need to become more sustainable. They need to uh, address diversity, equity, and inclusion better if they want to fulfill the need of their customer better as well. Bill, is there anything else? No, I think that's exactly right. I think it, again, it's explicit intent and uh, resources to get it done, absolutely. I mean, I don't want to trivialize how Insurance is an execution-based business, right? You price it, you sell it, you manage loss costs, you get a decent investment return. But in between those explicit processes, it's hard. And the point you made earlier, in the end, these organizations are nothing more than the collective capabilities of all of the people. Yes, the technology matters, the underlying business process matters. But in the end, do you have the right people focused on the right things that are motivated to give their discretionary effort to get it done. It's critical and that's not going to disappear 
even with AI and quantum computing and all the technology. I think we as an industry do not attract our fair share of high skill, high will talent, given how important we are to uh, global and individual economies. And I think organizations and insurers who focus on that talent agenda are going to win. And it's going to have implications for higher performing people, but also for better technology and better process in the end. It, in the end, it's, are you attracting talent? And, and poss a possible correlation to that is, is I, I noticed, Bill, in your analysis, it's talking about, I, I've wrote it down here, that the top performers were seeing 85% of their revenues coming through underwriting, as opposed to the lower performers who were seeing about less than 50%. So it, to, to me, that, that says they know, they, they know their stuff. They, they know the product lines. They, they, and to Sabine's point, regionally, they know where to, how to operate. And they're, they're yielding profits through their underwriting. Yeah, Paul, that, that, we didn't have a lot of time due to the time constraint, but Paul's touching on a very important point here. Um, Europe is unique in that there's a great deal of commingling of banking and insurance. Um, the only uh, geography in the world that looks like that is South America and particularly Brazil. We've got large banks uh, having insurance operations. To Paul's point, the highest performers had more than 85% of their revenue coming from insurance premiums. And when you look to lower performers, they tended to dabble or experiment or use it as a compliment. I think insurance requires focused execution, right? There's learning by doing that goes on. And it, it would appear from our study that dabbling, mixing insurance with a bit of life and pension, with a bit of banking, with maybe some retail, it isn't as effective. It's hard to sustain higher performance. Our data shows that those organizations on average with high performance had more than 85% of their revenue coming from insurance premium with less than 15% coming from ancillary type of financial services or non-financial services revenue. This is an important distinction. Overall, high performance requires focus, whether it's a country, whether it's a line of business, or whether it's insurance as a segment overall. Right, so that's, that's really interesting. And I think um, we've seen some of that specialization in the life markets sort of slimming down and uh, in the UK and, and really streamlining themselves. And just on the question we've got here, great to see we've got a, a global audience, because Videncio, Yabera, he's um, from Kenya. He has a question. Hello, I am from Kenya, and I would request you weigh in on what insurers in Africa need to do to increase on adoption, stroke embrace of technology by customers. And secondly, what needs to be done to increase the insurance penetration mm -hmm. in Africa? So... Who would like to answer that? I'll start with that. I had spent a great deal of time um, both in uh, North and Sub-Saharan Africa uh, in previous careers. And, and uh, Accord has a significant number of members across Africa and spent a great deal of time there. I think when I look to Africa, tremendous potential in terms of increased penetration. I think a couple of things. One, unique and differentiated products tailored to specific African countries taking products, services, and approaches from other parts of the world and bringing them to Africa is not effective. Africa is truly unique, right? Looking at the 100 plus countries, right? Really requires tailoring. Taking uh, tr products that may have been developed in Asia or in Europe or in uh, the Americas and trying to transplant them to Africa doesn't work, right? There needs to be uh, uh, tailored products and that means tailored capability models. And when I think about a capability of an African insurer, that includes not only strategic intent, but the inputs, the outputs, the tasks, the technology. In some ways, Africa is far more advanced than the rest of the world in terms of underlying technology, in terms of comfort level of Africans. And again, when you say Africa, if you've seen one country, you've seen one, they're really unique and differentiated. But I can say that the infrastructure and the technology is far more advanced. So they don't have the same kind of legacy infrastructure, so they can be. And lastly, the organization, uh, the culture, the values, the shared work norms, and all the rest of that. That being said, the products tend to need, need to be more uh, uh, tailored in terms of premium, smaller size, right? You're not going to be insuring necessarily a house 
worth several hundred thousand pounds. It may be apartments, it may be a bicycle, it may be a phone. So it tends to be smaller in terms of scale. But I think there needs to be a concerted effort on the part of carriers operating in, uh, across African countries to spend time educating. Because when you look to mature countries, you tend to see a higher uh, understanding as to what insurance can do to serve whether it's life or the, whether it's non-life. And it requires a lot of education, right? When you look to countries like, let's say, Japan and Korea, there's six life insurance policies per household. In the United States, we have less than one life insurance policy. There's nothing inherent about people buying life insurance, but a great deal of time and money and resources were spent in South Korea and Japan to educate the importance of life insurance. That same time of education didn't occur in the United States. So people aren't inherently more apt to buy life insurance or non-life cover. It requires education and investment if you wanna create pull demand. The challenge though for carriers is there's a free rider effect. Are you as a African carrier going to spend a lot of money investing it? Are you gonna get more than your fair share? But I think, yes, you will if you spend time and money, but it requires a concerted effort. But Sabine, you may wanna comment on it as well. I would say you, you, you touched the three points I was going to make, which is education. You can't just sell a product without educating. Then it's investment, you know, it's going to take time and then allocating the time to do it. And, you know, whilst I was listening to the question, I was, uh, you know, remembering some of the uh, insurers I've been working with in, in mostly in South Africa. So I cannot pretend that I've, you know, done the, the whole of Africa. And I think it's time, you know, it's, um, we try an initiative and we don't realize often that it needs to mature and we need to educate the, the recipient around the value of insurance. And then there is the learning from macro financing and macro insurance products, which have already been uh, developed in, in Africa, which needs to go to, to be to, to go across across the country. I would say that um, from looking at Asia, whilst Asia and Africa are very different, there are amazing example of um, of scaling up and growing up businesses, which have done amazing work to actually provide insurance and financial product to their um, to the less fortunate ones, to the underserved markets. So worthwhile looking at what's happening in some of the other markets too. Well, we've only got a couple of minutes, a very easy question to round off and a, a really lovely compliment here from uh, Abhinav Sharma. And he says, will this report uh, be published or how can we get a copy of these data points? That's for Bill. And also um, study is really impressive and, and only second to the brilliant zestful narrative of Sabine and Bill. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, <laughs> thank, you so there, so thank you very yes, much. No, um, thank you. Bill and I know each other for a long time. Oh, we, yeah, I, I don't want to say how long we've known each other because we'll give our ages away, but a very, <laughs> very long time. Very long time. Um, uh, yes, a white paper is being developed. It was sponsored by CGI. And I think uh, I know the author, a uh, person who's helping to draft it, uh, with the input is on the call, but we won't let him speak. Uh, he's working on it uh, fast and furious with the team and then Sabine will edit it and look at it as will I, and then it will be published and available as well. So thank you for the compliment and it's our joy to share it. And I tell you, as, it, as fun as this was to do it, I can't wait for next year and the year after that because it will only grow over time. I said the one we do in the US is 20 years we've been doing it. Um, it's actually been longer than that, um, but you gain so much knowledge looking at it over time. So I'm very much looking forward to continue. We'll never not do this study. And I'd like to see it grow beyond the 40 initial, right? Assuming that we can get better data and quality data outside of those top 40. But um, yes, there will be a white paper. And um, thank you for the compliment. Thank you. Thanks Excellent for stuff. supporting us as well. <laughs> yeah, so we've come to the end of the uh, presentation. So that just leaves me to say thank you very much to our sponsors, CGI, for making this happening. Thank you for Paul and CGI and the team there, of course. Thank you to Bill, of course, for the presentation, which is excellently done. And of course, Sabine for joining us and all the attendees and questions which are put forward and the Insurance Times team work on the background um, with the technology. So thank you everyone for this. And um, that just leaves me to say goodbye and have a great afternoon. <laughs>